Okay, this is the first video for the Closer Reading channel. And I uh, just want to start reading right away. This is uh, Dover Beach by Matthew Arndt. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray, where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles, which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith, was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. <laughs> That's one of my favorite poems ever. Um, it's so beautiful and it's so peaceful, but the whole time you hear the, the, the suggestion of violence to come, you know, that at every time we're, we're living in a state of peace, it's something to be grateful for because it doesn't last. There's always, there's always the threat of, you know, things to come, you know, the, the ignorant armies are always, you know, on the rise somewhere. But with each, with each, with each, uh, there's only four parts of it, but it's, it's so beautiful. Um, and, uh, he's in Dover beach in, uh, the United Kingdom where it's, uh, right across from France. And, uh, you know, the, those two countries have historically been through lots, hundreds of years of wars against each other. And, um, you know, now they're at peace again. And it seemed totally stupid, which it always was for the countries to be warring, for those people to think that there was enough to separate them to want to murder each other wholesale. But every time you read it, you get a little bit more out of it. Um, this time I was just thinking about the, the naked shingles of the world when he's talking about the sea of faith and how that's what we hold on to that keeps us from despairing, you know? And he's talking about the sea of faith of Christianity, but we should all really be thinking about the, the faith that this doesn't happen, you know, that the faith that we are more than these ignorant armies, you know, that humanity will aspire and hopefully renew itself and move towards, you know, more peaceful states, which I'd say the second half of this century, uh, of the 20th century, so since World War II, even though there were some, uh, you know, a lot of ugliness in the second half. It was a vast improvement from World War One and World War Two, which were pretty horrific. And um, you know, ever since World War Two, there's 
been a kind of understanding that if this happens again, it'll probably be the last because of the, uh, you know, the uh, atomic uh, weapons that ended that war. So I'm going to move on to the next poem we're going to read, which is an introduction to uh, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. But first, I want to read this poem, which I think has a very big influence on the beginning of that book, which I've, it is a very confusing book, and it's huge. It's like almost 800 pages. So there is a lot to not understand about it. But I think to start it, it's, it's a really, there's a lot to love right off the bat too. And there's a lot that you want to kind of read and reread because the whole novel is, is a poem. Um, and it's a series of songs and all his books that I've really read and grown accustomed to are uh, performative, that they're, you know, they have characters in them or scenes that make you feel like you're watching a play. You're watching a scene that someone has built, it's not just a story being told, but something that someone wants you to uh, appreciate and is also uh, an artist's attempt to use their own genius and discover the limits of their own genius by pushing it as far as they possibly can. And this is another artist who did the same, is Hart Crane. And which is this one? To Brooklyn Bridge, which he is from a book of poems called The Bridge. And uh, they're all pretty damn amazing. This is the first one. And uh, he lived in the Brooklyn side of it. And uh, is just kind of looking out at the bridge and it became to him a kind of symbol for individuals, but also for God. How many dawns chill from his rippling rest, the seagull's wings shall dip and pivot him, shedding white rings of tumult, building high over the chained bay waters liberty. Then, with inviolate curve, forsake our eyes, as apparitional as sails that cross some page of figures to be filed away till elevators drop us from our day. I think of cinemas, panoramic slates with multitudes bent towards some flashing scene, never disclosed but hastened to again, foretold to other eyes on the same screen. And thee across the harbor, silver paced, as though the sun took step of thee, yet left some motion ever unspent in thy stride, implicitly thy freedom staying thee. Out of some subway scuttle, cell or loft, a bedlamite speeds to thy parapets, tilting there momently, shrill shirt ballooning, a jest falls from the speechless caravan. Down wall. From girder into street noon leaks, a rip tooth of the skies acetylene. All afternoon, the cloud flown derricks turn, thy cables breathe the North Atlantic still, and obscure as that heaven of the Jews thy guerdon, accolade thou dost bestow, of an anonymity time cannot raise, vibrant reprieve and pardon thou dost show. O oh, harp and altar of the fury fused, how could mere toil align thy choiring strings? Terrific threshold of the prophet's pledge, prayer of pariah, and the lover's cry. Again the traffic lights that skim thy swift unfractioned idiom, immaculate sigh of stars, beating thy path, condense eternity, and we have seen night lifted in thine arms. Under thy shadow by the piers I waited. Only in darkness is thy shadow clear. The city's fiery parcels, all undone. Already snow submerges an iron year. O oh, sleepless as the river under thee, vaulting the sea, the prairie's dreaming sod, unto us lowliest sometimes sweep, descend and up the curved ship lend a myth to God. Gets better every time.
it's a prayer for the lowest of us. It's a prayer for, you know, um, anyone who needs it the absolute most, you know, the, the prayers of the pariahs, the Bedlamite who, you know, it took me, I've read that poem probably a hundred times. Um, and I didn't understand what was happening the first couple of times, but basically there's a, a man up who <laughs> rushes out on the, on the bridge and jumps. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the fifth, uh, stanza of the poem it's it's so you know it's it's heartbreaking you don't get to meet him and basically what he is is a part and parcel of you that he's and at the same time he's also a part of the bridge which is all of us which in its essence is just connection which is what the bridge functions as a metaphor a spiritual metaphor for all of us but also it is a physical connection for Manhattan and Brooklyn, which is why it works so well. But that part, you know, it's, it's, he, uh, the, the man tilting there momently, shrill shirt ballooning, you know, he's he, just that shr word shrill is the only indication you get uh, for, you know, the, the horror that's, that is that line, you know? And then he says, a jest falls from the speechless caravan that basically is people witness this and they're all completely dumbfounded you know just just you know like anyone would be you know the, the the loss of life is universal we all feel it so poignantly um but of course one person you know some idiot <laughs> it says a jest falls from the speechless caravan so you know in the same way that the man is falling a just the you know the act of pure despair a person makes a joke out of it you know it's it's inevitable there's always going to be uh you know miserable people who you know are probably in a lot of pain themselves but um but he's after that he says a down wall from girder into street new leaks so that's the man is uh bleeding you know this his body what's left of him and he says, a rip tooth of the sky's acetylene. Acetylene is a, a chemical mixture. And I, he's um, basically saying that he's a rip tooth of us, <laughs> you know, that the bridge, the city, the people are all one. And they lost one, you know, like the, uh, what's that poem? Um, Never sent to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. The, there's a line in that one is, if a clod be washed, from the sea, Europe is the less that every every man's death diminishes me, and my death will diminish humanity. So, tons of great um, poems by Hart Crane. I don't think he wrote a bad one, but this is the beginning of Gravity's Rainbow, which. Just as a quick introduction to that, um, he was writing about the V2 rockets in London and um, basically the development of the technology that allowed us to send projectiles into orbit, which is the start of the space race, ironically. So it's a, a dual symbol for intense hope. And of course, the fact that they were launching rockets from Holland to London is incredible and horrifying. So, you know, there's um, some more duality of men, but Pynchon isn't sure in, in the book, even though he finds the rocket to be something quite like God and a connecting, um, a, a connecting function kind of similar to what the bridge is, but, you know, obviously much darker. But let me just begin. A screaming comes across the sky. It has happened before, but there is nothing to compare it to now. It is too late. The evacuation still proceeds, but it's all theater. There are no lights inside the cars, no light anywhere. Above him lift girders, old as an iron queen, and glass somewhere far above that would let 
the light of day through, but it's night. He's afraid of the way the glass will fall. Soon, it will be a spectacle, the fall of a crystal palace, but coming down in total blackout without one glint of light, only great invisible crashing. He's talking about nuclear weapons, but it's it's the end. <laughs> the screaming comes across the sky. Yeah, we've launched missiles and rockets before and, you know, gotten better and better at destroying ourselves. But this is different. This is a sign of the end because he's not writing this in 45. He's writing this in 72. And I mean, leading up to 72, probably took him several years. It's, it's, he's basically talking about the end that basically we've had weapons before and there has been, you know, the slow, uh, death of, uh, human beings. You know, we all naturally break down and we're all, you know, born to die in a way, but this is much different. And he's going to talk about it a lot more throughout the book. Um, Inside the carriage, which is built on several levels, he sits in velveteen darkness, with nothing to smoke, feeling metal, near and farther, rub and connect, steam escaping in puffs, a vibration in the carriage's frame, a poising, an uneasiness and all the others pressed in around, feeble ones, second sheep, all out of luck and time, drunks, old veterans still in shock from ordinance 20 years obsolete, hustlers in city clothes, derelicts, exhausted women with more children than it seems could belong to anyone, stacked about among the rest of things to be carried out to salvation. Only the nearer faces are visible at all. And at that, only as half-silvered images in a viewfinder, green-stained VIP faces remembered behind bulletproof windows speeding through the city. They have begun to move. They pass in line out of the main station, out of downtown, and begin pushing in older and more desolate parts of the city. Is this the way out? Faces turn to windows, but no one dares ask, not out loud. Rain comes down. No, this is not a disentanglement from, but a progressive nodding into. He puts that word nodding into in italics to reference um, his last book, which is The Crying of Lot 49, which is very, very similar to this. And it basically has the same main idea, which is that the derelicts are us. We're all doomed to the same fate, and it's the same fate that is shared by all of our possessions as well. Also like the bridge, that we're all united by a shared destiny. And the belief that we are separate <laughs> is an illusion. It's just because we think of ourselves that way, that doesn't necessarily make it. And that's what uh, Pynchon and Crane and a lot of other artists all kind of believe in the, the shared humanity, but also Pynchon takes it a step further and says that the impressions that we leave on things and the impressions they leave on us make them uh, a much deeper part of us. Actually, I heard a really good quote from him talking about cell phones and saying about how we've kind of uh, limited all our possessions to this one thing that, again, we think of as separate from us, but it's certainly not separate from us because we're constantly used to it. And what you do, it becomes what you are. So where was I? But a progressive nodding into. They go in under archways, secret entrances, 
of rotted concrete that only looked like loops of an underpass. Certain trestles of blackened wood have moved slowly by overhead, and the smell begun of coal from days far to the past smells of naphtha winters, of Sundays when no traffic came through, of the coral-like and mysteriously vital growth around the blind curves and out the lonely spurs, a sour smell of rolling stock absence, of maturing rust, developing through those emptying days, brilliant and deep, especially at dawn with blue shadows to seal its passage, to try to bring events to absolute zero. And it is poorer the deeper they go, ruinous secret cities of poor, places whose names he has never heard. The walls break down, the roofs get fewer, and so do the chances for light. The road, which ought to be opening out into a broader highway, instead has been getting narrower, more broken, cornering tighter and tighter until all at once, much too soon, they are under the final arch. Brakes grab and spring terribly. It is a judgment from which there is no appeal. The caravan has halted. It is the end of the line. All the vacuees are ordered out. They move slowly, but without resistance. Those marshalling them wear cockades the color of lead and do not speak. It is some vast, very old and dark hotel, an iron extension of the track and switchery by which they have come here, just an extension of what brought them there. There's no difference between the two. History, he's saying, is, isn't very different at all. Globular lights, painted a dark green, hang from under the fancy iron eaves, unlit for centuries. The crowd moves without murmurs or coughing, down corridors, straight and functional as warehouse aisles. Velvet black surfaces contain the movement. The smell is of old wood of remote wings empty all this time just reopened to accommodate the rush of souls. Of gold plaster where all the rats have died, only their ghosts still as cave paintings, fixed, stubborn, and luminous in the walls. The evacuees are taken in lots by elevator, a moving wood scaffold open on all sides, hoisted by old tarry ropes and cast iron pulleys whose spokes are shaped like S's. At each brown floor, passengers move on and off, thousands of these hushed rooms without light. Some wait alone. Some share their invisible rooms with others. Invisible, yes. What do the furnishings matter at this stage of things? Underfoot crunches the oldest of city dirt, last crystallizations of all the city had denied, threatened, lied to its children. Each has been hearing a voice, one he thought was talking only to him, say, you didn't really believe you'd be saved. Come, we all know who we are now. No one was ever going to take the trouble to save you, old fellow. It's a total nightmare. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's the end of the world, but these are just people from London who are, you know, um, getting bombed day and night at the end of, uh, 44 before, uh, Christmas of 44, the Germans are just raining fire on them, uh, pretty constantly. And uh, the final stage of it was the V2 rockets, which were, uh, Pretty awful. And we were lucky that they didn't develop sooner because that, I can't imagine any kind of city could have, you know, I mean, they would have just gotten obliterated eventually if they had launched enough of them. What they did was incredibly catastrophic. I think they killed 55,000 people or something like that. It's a, a ridiculous number because they were launching them from Holland. <laughs> like it's, 
It's incredible. All right, I'm going to continue again. There is no way out. They lie and wait, lie still and be quiet, screaming holds across the sky. When it comes, will it come in darkness or will it bring its own light? Will the light come before or after? So that screaming holds across the sky is a reference to the first line. The screaming is still there. It's going to stay there for pretty much the whole, uh, um, for at least the whole section of the book, which is the first 190 pages. It's called Beyond the Zero. When it comes, will it come in darkness or will it bring its own light? Will the light come before or after? That's something that's going to be repeated throughout this because the rockets, because they've been launched from the atmosphere, I mean, excuse me, they've been launched into the atmosphere, are moving faster than the speed of sound. So when they hit, they hit and nobody hears a thing. And then moments later, you hear the sound of everything the rocket touched. <laughs> so it's the sound is the ghost of um, the rocket and all the people who presumably got killed, the buildings that it crashed into, you don't hear it until it's until moments later. So the ghost of that survives. And that's what he's saying here is the, the idea of the light in the darkness, the great invisible crashing, that it's going to obliterate everything. And at the same time, was anything really there? Because nothing's to be nothing's to witness it. This part's great. But it is already light. How long has it been light? All this while, light has come percolating in. Along with the cold morning air flowing now across his nipples, it has begun to reveal an assortment of drunken wastrels, some in uniform and some not, clutching empty or near-empty bottles. Here draped over a chair, there huddled in a cold, into a cold fireplace, or sprawled on various divans, unhoovered rugs, and shea lounges. Down the different levels of the enormous room, snoring and wheezing at many rhythms, in self-renewing chorus, as London light, winter and elastic light, grows between the faces of the mullioned windows, grows among the strata, of last night's smoke, still hung, fading, from the wax beams of the ceiling. All these horizontal here, these comrade in arms, look just as rosy as a bunch of Dutch peasants dreaming of their certain resurrection in the next few minutes. His name is Captain Joffrey Pirate Prentice. He's wrapped in a thick blanket, a tartan orange, rust and scarlet. His skull feels made of metal. Just above him, 12 feet overhead, Teddy Bloat is about to fall out of the minstrel's galley, having chosen to collapse just at the spot where somebody, in a grandiose fit weeks before, had kicked out two of the empty, the ebony balusters. Now, in his stupor, Bloat has been inching through the opening head, arms, and torso, until all that's keeping him up there is an empty champagne split in his hip pocket. It's got hooked somehow. By now, Pirate has managed to sit up on his narrow bachelor bed and blink about. How awful, how bloody awful. Above him, he hears cloth rip. The special operations executive has trained him to fast responses. He leaps off the cot and kicks it rolling on its casters in Bloat's direction. Bloat, plummeting, hits square amidships with a great strum of bed springs. One of the legs collapses. Good morning, notes Pirate. Bloat smiles briefly and goes back to sleep, snuggling well into Pirate's blanket. Bloat is one of the co-tenants of the place, a masonette erected last century, not far from the Chelsea embankment, by Gordon Thrasp an acquaintance of the Rossettis, who wore hair smocks and liked to cultivate pharmaceutical plants up on the roof, a tradition young Osby Feel has lately revived. A few of them, hardy enough to survive frogs and frost, but most returning as fragments of peculiar alkaloids, 
to rooftop earth, along with the manure of a trio of prized West, Wessex saddleback sows courted there by Thrust's successor, and dead leaves off many decorative trees transplanted to the roof by later tenants, and the old unstomachable meal thrown or vomited there by this or that sensitive Epicurean. All got scumbled together eventually by the knives of the seasons into an impasto, feet thick, of unbelievably of unbelievable black topsoil into which anything could grow, not the least being bananas. Pirate, driven to despair by the wartime banana shortage, decided to build a glass hothouse on the roof and persuade a friend who flew the Rio to extent to extension to Fort Lamy. Run to pinch him a sapling banana tree or two in exchange for a German camera should Pirate happen across one on his next mission by parachute. Oh. He's already starting the scene, and basically that's what he does. He builds these giant scenes for uh, a kind of stage play to kind of happen in your mind while you're reading it. And uh, boy, does he ever. Like, the introduction, all that... You know, all that about the rockets, the screaming, the, you know, the people was just kind of, you know, in a sense, building us into an introduction of, you know, the soldiers that are all, you know, what does he call them? Drunken wastrels. Um, and uh, there's another thing I noticed that is uh, an image he likes to use is the smoke that's hung in the ceiling still what does it say last night's smoke so what has literally been blown out all of these drunken sleeping people's lungs is still hung fading from the wax beams of the ceiling another way that we make our surroundings and the things the uh, the impressions we make on them are physically you know our own uh you know, the, you know, the, the insides of ourselves. And that's the same thing about this, uh, uh, hot house where he's making the bananas that there's, um, you know, it starts with the, um, the, the sows, the, the, the manure from the, um, the sows that are kind of supporting this greenhouse. And, um, you know, and it just, he just goes on about all the different things, you know, there's, uh, and not to get too gross, but it's a pretty gross book. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just going to keep getting added to, and that's kind of what the, uh, stage of things. And when he's talking about, um, Teddy Bloat falling from the minstrel's galley. You know, it's just he's he's holding on from like a champagne split, and it's um he doesn't even know exactly how it's gotten where to how it is like that he's somehow being supported. That's to me is how the author feels about the thing. You know, he's writing this book and actually starting this book, and he's just like why am I still here? You know, like the, the cold war was, um, was pretty bad in the, um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of been, been the stakes ever since nuclear weapons were invented that every day we know could be the last, you know, something could happen. You know, we have the, we have the capabilities to end it all. And somehow it hasn't happened yet. But that's where faith comes in. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's religious faith. Going back to the first thing I was talking about, the, 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 the sea of faith, which, you know, has retreated. But I think it'll always hopefully stay there, that, that we can just have faith that we are 
we're, you know, that, that we, we're in this, that we want to progress and there will be things that will terrify us and make us despair and think that it's all over, you know, like our, our hands been dealt and we're, you know, we got to cash out and there will be tragedies and all kinds of things that have happened in the past and will continue to happen. But we keep the faith that life will keep going, you know, every new life is, you know, before it happens, a seeming impossibility, and then it's there. All right. I'm going to cut this session off at this point, but um, I hope everybody enjoyed this one. And uh, yeah, I'll hopefully be able to post this too, because otherwise it's just a live stream. <laughs>